Morning Chair. And um, so at this point, we'll ask uh, Kim to swear you in. And before she does that, if you could introduce each person that is going to uh, be um, testifying today, Brian. Sure. Uh, good to see you all. Um, um, the people that you're swearing in today will be myself, Brian Nall, President and CEO of North Country Hospital, and also our um, CFO, Tracy Paul. Would you both please raise your right hand? Do you swear the evidence you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Thank you. And whenever you're ready, Brian, you can begin. Okay, let me see if I can get the share thing to work here. <laughs> uh, I got it to work too well. <laughs> uh, Tracy, why don't you do it on your end? It's not coming up on my tray. Okay, let's see if I can do it now. Uh, there you go. There All right. you go. All right. Okay. All right. Well, again, um, glad to be here virtually with you all. Um, hope you and your families are doing well. Um, obviously, life in all of our state has been um, uniquely different this year, um, but we are settled into the new norm. And uh, and as we present our our uh, budget, uh, look forward to your insight and in, and your questions. Um, next slide, Tracy. So. Um, so Tracy and I will be present. Go ahead, Tracy. Next slide. Um, so it's just a reminder of our service area. Um, press that a couple more times, Tracy. I think there's a couple other things there. Uh, our service area here at the north north, north end of the state, um, a service area of 30,000. Uh, we have 45 minutes to the closest Kirk Access Hospital, and it's two hours to the, to the nearest tertiary hospital, that being uh, UVM and Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, and, and on the next slide, slide five, uh, we show just the reminder of our organizational um, institutional structure. So we are representing the hospital here today, um, uh, North Country Hospital and Health Center, but other components of our business. We do have North Country Health Services, Inc., which was previously operating, um, doing business as Derby Green Nursing Home, uh, which was closed effective May, uh, May 1st of this year. Uh, we'll we'll talk a little about that later, um, and then we also venture with North North Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and VRH in our LLC, and we have services that, um, that are sleep services and pulmonary services uh, currently. And so that's that's a quick overview on the organization, and we're going to get into the budget presentation. I'm going to pass it off to Tracy on slide six. Good morning. Um, I'd like to apologize for Gifford and to the board for my little too quick on the slide. Um, I guess there's such a thing as being too prepared, um, and I guess that's what I was trying to do. Um, but to start the presentation, um, I'd like to start this by talking about how we, um, the assumptions we used when we were completing the budget. Basically, we went back and based our budget on our year-to-date actual, which we considered our normal. Um, and from there, we budgeted by exception. Basically, we knew what our service line adjustments would be, uh, FTE changes, inflations, and et cetera. So we took the, the year-to-date February and uh, worked from that as our base. Um, we assumed that the COVID impact on our budget would be minimal um, because we continue to operate now in the COVID environment. So as you can see on our screen right now on slide six, we have the income statement um, up there. What I'm gonna do in the slides to follow is to go over the different pieces of the income statement. So on slide seven, we're requesting a fee increase on gross revenues of 3.6. That is made up of a 4.25 fee increase on the hospital side and a zero increase on the medical group side. Um, that's less of a fee increase that we requested last year and about the same that we did for 2019. Um, our net patient revenue is actually going down by about 1% from budget to budget. Um, we based our gross revenues on our year-to-date February, um, and some of our revenues were down at that point. 
Um, we also have seen a small decrease in our net percentage. In slide eight, uh, talking about other operating revenue, um, a familiar story to all of you, 340B um, is the major component. It actually makes up 64% of our other operating revenue here. Um, our non-operating revenue, um, the story to that basically is we changed investment companies January 1st of this 2020. Um, and when we did that, if you look at our projected, you see a big $9 million number. And that was because of the fact that we had to realize those gains from switching the investment companies. Um, slide nine shows the total operating expenses. Um, in a bar chart, and you can see our operating expenses um, actually have only gone up 0.2% from 20 budget to 2021 budget. Some of the things in our operating budget that drives it are compensation and benefits. We put a modest 2% raising raise into this budget and a 4% inflation factor on our benefits. Our locums and travelers are basically the dollar amount budget to budget are flat. Um, the COVID related costs that are in this budget are minimal and they circle around supply testing costs and securing our campus with screeners. Um, and the furlough of staff will be talked about in an upcoming slide. Um, another kind of cut of some of our, the biggest part of our operating expenses. The slide shows you that if we take our compensation, our benefits and our locums and we add them all together, um, that you're going to see that for the budget 2021, that they make up 65% of our total expenses for North Country Hospital. And these two slides break down locum, just locum expenses themselves, which are about 3%. Uh, which are a little bit higher than last year budget, but they are less than what we're running right now. And the other slide on the bottom actually shows you how much physician salaries make up of our total salary budget. So they make up about 30% of our salary budget. So um, in, in, at North Country Hospital in our market, we employ nearly 100% of the, the physicians. So, um, and when it looks, when you're looking at our wages compared to other industries, that um, that has to be a factor in there as well. But um, the the advantage of that is that um, that when it comes to one care and and uh, those types of ACO value based programs, we're all in all together. Um, and that and this has been something in our community that's been a part. The the physicians being part of our community for. Uh, or our organization has been that way for quite some time. Um, there just hasn't been the appetite in our community for any private practices. Uh, and and any new hires that we have, they're, they're looking for employed um, and not setting up private practice. Okay, so moving on to our operating margin. Um, this graph shows you what our journey has been in this fiscal year, starting in October until June with COVID right smack dab in the middle, basically. Um, this graph shows uh, with us with the CARES relief money added in to help make up for the net revenue we lost. Um, you can see, uh, I think like much many other hospitals, March, the blue line represents actual, the green line represents budget, and you can see what happened in March. Um, but from March, we've been going steadily upward. Um, Pre-COVID, our revenues were down about 1.4%. March, they were under 20, April 50, May 22. But then June and July, our revenues are actually over budget slightly between 2 and 4%. Um, that combined with um, expense decreases that we have done during that time frame has made a, a favorable bottom line during that time frame. The next graph is another cut on this, and this basically shows what would happen without any of the CARES Act funds that we got to help replace the net revenues. Um, so again, you see the big dip. The dip lasts much longer, a couple months longer, um, and then we come back up and uh, meet budget and then exceed budget because of the way our revenues recovered. So for the operating margin uh, year to date June, actually we have 1.9 million, which is a 3% operating margin. The budget for year to date June was 2%. Last year's budget was 1.6. And we are asking for 2021 budget to basically have the same amount of operating margin of $1.5 million as we did for budget 2020. 
This is the balance sheet. Um, basically, the biggest change in the balance sheet, of course, is the cash. Uh, we have lar a large amount of cash in the 2020 projected. 2021 budget is back down to what we would call a normal level cash, about $2 million. Um, and our cash on hand um, is 228 days. Um, this is just another look at our cash flow balances and showing how they go from 2019, um, the increase from projected year to date, and then the um, 2021 budget. Um, again, uh, we are requesting a 3.6 rate increase. Um, and the charge increase effect on payers is as follows. Um, for Medicare, uh, inpatient Medicare is reimbursed by a patient day. So an increase in charge does not result in any net revenue. Outpatient is reimbursed based on percent of charge. So it does result in net revenue, but it is all subject to our cost report at the end of the day. Um, Medicaid, uh, increase in charge for Medicaid does not result in net revenue for either inpatient or outpatient. Inpatient is per day. Outpatient is by a fee schedule. Um, commercial, for the most case and mostly on the outpatient side, it does percent of they pay by percent of charge. So the percent of charge does result in increased net to our bottom line. Um, the effect of bad debt, the effect to bad debt and free care from a fee increase, basically uh, that we use a calculation of a percentage of gross revenue, averaging it over a couple of years to determine what our percentage of bad debt and free care would be. So I'm going to talk through the service line adjustments as it relates to the current year and future year. So um, neurology was a service line that the hospital has been supporting a full-time physician for um, quite some time. And um, with the obstacles of, uh, in front of us with COVID and during that time, this was a service line that, um, that needed to, that we decided to make a change on. And we, we effectively closed the service line uh, and made that announcement in April. Um, we are looking at returning, and there, uh, this service line wasn't uh, profitable, so it was, it was really a um, fiscal stewardship uh, action, um, and uh, we weren't seeing a, um, a high volume enough to support, we believe, the full-time practice. So what we're doing right now is looking at in, um, the future, um, possibly in 2021, a return to part-time uh, maybe two to four days uh, a month. I'm sorry, two two days a month to maybe um, one day a week. Uh, but it, we couldn't continue to support it under the full time. Um, so that's what's going on with neuro neurology. With cardiology, uh, we did a, a service a service line assessment of um, what our population can support across all services. And cardiology was one that we were under. We were we were not providing enough care in our community. Um, our community can support uh, uh, upwards of or close to two cardiologists. And before we would just had one part-time cardiologist. So we've invested that, and that's built in the budget for FY20. Um, it's already active in uh, sorry FY21, but it's already active in FY21 or 20. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but the increase is um, to full time to fit that need. And it's been received very well. We're currently four weeks out scheduling um, and we bring in another cardiologist. Um, uh, both cardiologists are, uh, they come from Dartmouth Hitchcock. They're employed by Dartmouth, but they work for North Country Hospital. So we bring another cardiologist in uh, one or two days a month to help catch that up. So uh, the cardiology program um, is received and doing well. Ophthalmology services, we lost our one and only solo provider in the community. He was independent. Um, he left the community to, um, to become an educator and part-time ophthalmologist uh, in New Hampshire. So we're working at exploring ways to try to attract that talent. Um, so we've lost, and it's built in our FY21 budget, we've lost the ophthalmology surgeries in our OR. Um, and uh, th there's a possible uh, opportunity to explore a solution through our LLC uh, that we're, we're dialoguing with NBRH. Um, um, neither community employs uh, ophthalmologists, but maybe that would be something that we would need to do to attract that talent. Slide 20, uh, just giving some um, 
perspective of how we've navigated through COVID. So pre-COVID, uh, as a reminder, and Tracy mentioned, we were we were doing well um, going into to the uh, COVID cycle. Uh, so February year to date, our operating margin was better than budget, about a 1.9 percent budget, a uh, 1.9 percent actual compared to a 1 percent budget. Um, and then COVID in the months of March on the next slide, March through May, we experienced a 20 to 50% loss over those months. 50% loss would have been um, in May, or sorry, April. And then May, we started to return um, back to normal. So closer to a 25 to 20% loss in May. Uh, we were using at um, our high point, about 80% of our encounters were telehealth. Uh, visits uh, through our practices. Um, so we flipped our model from in-person to the majority telehealth. That coincidentally has changed, and I'll, I'll talk about that, um, I think, in another slide coming up. Uh, our low point um, with our staff was um, furloughing of up to 200 staff. 25% uh, staff also worked from home when they, when they had jobs that would allow them to work from home. And then we also did a physician and leaders um, voluntary wage decrease, um, and that was received very well. The physicians was a voluntary, the leaders was mandatory, um, and that went into effect at, during those months. Slide 22 shows, um, again, March through May. So we started, we also stood up COVID testing at our cost for two counties, Orleans and Essex counties. And um, we also, like most hospitals, uh, had to put staffing in for entry screeners and the controlled access into our buildings. We activated uh, in March our daily incident command, and that's been active and continues to be active to this day. It was operating seven days a week. We turned that down. Uh, we still continue to act, you know, uh, have daily huddles around um, activity on our campus and our communities. And um, through this time, um, we, act, we had already announced the closure of Derby Green, and um, it was a little te tense there for us um, because we were winding this down as there was an outbreak in another nursing home in, in, um, in our state. And so uh, we were concerned that we weren't going to be able to wind this down in time and have to operate it when we had, at that time, roughly uh, five to seven patients still left to transition to their new homes. Um, but we were able to accomplish that and actually close that, that campus by April 1st. Um, so it was about a month early than, um, than we had um, expected. And, uh, and then we've kept that, that structure in place for possible surge. Um, just this last, uh, over these last couple of weeks, we even talked to the local nursing homes about possible use of this space for um, quarantine. So um, um, using that uh, as an opportunity to um, use it for the greater good for that service line if, 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 if they see the need. Um, but we're also uh, mindful of it being used for other purposes um, in, in the case of surge. Um, and the state has also contacted us about use of it and planning, planning for use of it um, in case of a surge. So we still have 23 beds set up um, in that space and um, and have them readily available um, in the case of need. Slide 23 um, shows uh, how we've navigated through the months of June and July. So we returned uh, the majority of those furloughed staff. We're, we're about 150 returned of the, of the 200. Uh, our telemedicine visits uh, oh, and, and on the, the furloughed, most of those people that are still furloughed are modified hours, so they might be working 32 hours a week rather than 40 hours a week. Um, and, uh, and so um, on our telehealth side, uh, remember I said that we were about 80% telehealth visits. We're under 10% of our visits now are telemedicine visits. Uh, what we've learned through this uh, um, time has been that people desire to be seen in person, which I think is good when we think about the competitive products upcoming in our industry with the use of telehealth, um, with you know the Apples and the Googles and the Amazons of the world wanting to stand up um, the telehealth products. I think there's a place for it, but um, generally in our community, what we're learning is 
that people still want that in-person encounter and find um, a, a extreme value in that. So that's that's good to know. Um, we have uh, we've been able to because of our return to norm. We've also been able to discontinue the voluntary wage decrease. Um, we have hired permanent staff for screeners, um, and we're also getting thermo scans that we'll be putting in place that should arrive in the next few weeks um, um, uh, oh, to, to, to um, use across our campus and our medical office buildings. Uh, and then we continue to really look at forward of how are we can operate in the fall um, and into the spring much um, like we operate today. So uh, on slide 24, August and beyond, uh, we we're working on, you know, we continue to focus on generating healthy margins um, and making sure we stabilize that so that we can we can move the organization forward beyond COVID um, and be thinking about what are we going to do beyond COVID. And so one of the big projects that we had um, started on for FY20 was our campus infrastructure and our need for continuing to invest in that infrastructure. And um, so we had a campus development plan um, finished up this last year, and uh, we were looking looking forward to what projects that that, that we would uh, as a hospital and a board that we would want to um, put forward as future uh, investments in, in the near future. So um, so by generating the healthy margins and looking at re reinvesting in the organization, we want to put some uh, some more effort into that coming up this this year. Uh, recruiting and retaining workforce was a was a challenge before. As a challenge, can you know, um, moving beyond COVID, um, we work hard to pay market rates. Um, we're still we struggle to keep up with that. Uh, we want to decrease our dependency on contract labor. You saw uh, that's three to four percent of, of our expense and our salaries. We do we are a host site for um, for the Vermont Technical College. We have a full slate of students. I think it's 18 that started uh, last week. Uh, we also sponsor $50,000 in scholarships for uh, for not only our staff but other um, students that are pursuing uh, uh, a career in, in, in uh, healthcare. In fact, this weekend we will have our annual golf scholarship, um, and that all the funds for the, the golf scholarship end up funding this this um, this program every year. And we still have board members. We still have, uh, if you want, we still have slots available if you want to come and play golf. <laughs> um, uh, uh, another thing that, that uh, what I like to call um, when we're when we're talking about August and beyond is really the focus on adaptive, active management. And we've really been in that mindset from the beginning, but um, uh, through this COVID. But uh, you know, we have daily safety huddles to assess what's going on. We have uh, we have. Um, challenges that we work through with workforce, which includes um, in this in this current cycle, what what housing needs that we might need to supply. Um, do we have uh, sick family members that will impact our employees coming to work? We have the Canadian border um, that we work through. But we have staff that cross the border daily to get to and from work. Um, and then uh, on the stewardship side, we. We look at and monitoring our cash flow, our, our use and supply of PPE, our equipment and resources, um, and also um, how our service lines are doing and, and looking at the impacts and their volume. So, uh, so when we look at the FY20 budget and we look at the FY21 budget, the budget is what our approximation is um, and our best, um, our, our best uh, estimate of what the year may look like. Um, but obviously, FY20, the budget went out the window uh, in mid-March. So adaptive active management is really the style that we work on of how are we uh, managing the finances that are in front of us and not um, not looking wholeheartedly just at the budget. Uh, so plenty of uncertainty with COVID impacts in the fall. Um, we, we have been having huddles with the school superintendents and, and, um, and their leaders to uh, assess what impacts and that that may have, um, but we'll continue to work on adapting um, and active management. So I'm gonna um, pass it now to Tracy for slide 25 to talk about the capital investment. 
Okay, so our capital budget we requested in 2020 was $3.6 million, and we're asking for the same amount of $3.6 million um, for 2021. Um, this capital budget is funded out of our operating cash. And one of the projects that we had um, slated for this year was uh, lab renovation. Um, and with the current climate, it didn't make the current environment didn't make sense to um, impact that space, uh, but we we have roughly two million dollar project that we expect to 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 put forward in the next um, twelve months or so to uh, to 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 reinvest in that that space. Um, we're meeting with our architects also over the next week to talk about what what learnings do we have from COVID on our campus plan to uh, see what we would do differently. Um, and so we'll be looking at that lab space as well. Um, the lab renovation is gonna be at the same location. So um, there's a lot of planning of how we would continue to, we'd have to how do we continue to function while we uh, renovate the existing lab? So there's a lot um, that has to be accounted for. And um, so we put that on pause given that uh, lab is very important with uh, the COVID testing right now. So uh, that's really high level, um, our perspective, our, our FY21 budget. Um, and uh, we'll turn it over to you for questions and comments. Great, thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, begin the questions today with board member Pelham, Tom. Did you see Holmes or Pelham? I'm, I'm thinking it was, it's your turn, but I could be wrong. <laughs> no, no, you're not. <laughs> um, so Brian, uh, thank you for the golfing uh, fundraiser invitation, but I'm afraid that uh, rate review when hospital budget seasons has totally destroyed my golf game. Uh, I, I won't be coming up to embarrass myself. Okay. Okay. <laughs> my, my first uh, question is on the, in the narrative and on the, um, uh, that tab, which we call the um, revenue replacement of funds, the, 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 the federal money. Um, you you note that there's a six point uh, six million seven hundred eighty nine thousand dollars in non-refundable revenues, um, and there's there's two pieces of that. One is six point five nine million, and the other is one hundred ninety four thousand. On the income statement, the COVID nineteen stimulus entry is uh, of that is four million three hundred twenty eight thousand, and so I'm just wondering where the remainder of you know, two almost 2.5 million is is booked on your income statement, um, or I mean, I I see can see that your non-operating budget is, you know, um, very high, but that's because of the liquidation of and changes of your investment manager. Um, but I, I'm just wondering where in in 2020 or 2021 is the balance of your non-refundable COVID revenues. The, the balance of the non-refunded uh, COVID revenues are on our balance sheet in a reserve. The amount of money, the $4 million that we have brought to our bottom line on our income statement is money that we can justify as net revenue loss. Um, we've been in contact with our auditors and you know nobody knows for sure, but there is going to be an audit at some point. So we wanted to be conservative and make sure that any of the money we received, we have the justification for that money. So we're being conservative and it, it's in our reserves on our balance sheet and has not dropped to our bottom line in case we have to pay it back at some point. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, hey, Tom, I would also say that um, with that, those funds, we still have ongoing expenses that we that Tracy has um, that she's tracking. Uh, so we, for example, standing up a um, COVID testing site, we have to bring that indoors. So we're we're going to be um, incurring some costs over the next several months of having a modular unit on site for that. So some of those funds will be used 
um, to, to fund that so that there would be um, no additional cost or impact on the bottom line on the income statement as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, the next area is um, bad debt and free care. Um, looking at kind of how you're trending in that arena on a combined basis in uh, your 2020 budget, uh, you were uh, looking for deductions at a $6.3 million level. And as we move into 2020 uh, projected, you were down to $5.3 million. And uh, for 2021 budget, you're at $4.8 million. So that's definitely a, a fairly strong downward trend in the commitment or the budgeting for uh, free care and bad debt. And I'm wondering, you know, what might be driving that trend? Um, yeah, okay, so like I said in my presentation, we do it as a percent of gross revenue. So for budget, it was 3% of the gross revenue, the total combined, and we're at 2.38. Um, the reason why I think that's going down is we have a very active navigator um, system up here. Um, we have, I think it's four navigators that are working full time to get people to uh, apply to Medicaid. Um, and I, th I believe that is part of the reason why that's going down because we are getting them coverage. Okay, that makes sense. Um, on the provider tax, uh, <clears throat> you budgeted um, in uh, for 2020, you budgeted uh, at the 6% rate, um, but then with the de you know, decline of uh, 2020 projected revenues, um, that rate is now up to 6.6% effectively. And I'm just wondering uh, uh, if you can provide a little added insight into you know, where you expect that to land. Um, as far as the projections of the numbers you're looking at, obviously we, we left them the same based on the actual and for budget. 21 uh, we added a small one percent increase um i really don't i am not sure where that will land for projected 20. yep okay and uh my next question has to do with kind of the reconciliation of of the um, npr on the income statement and the npr on the uh, payer mix table uh, those are off by um quite a bit uh for each of the years and I'm just, for example, for 2021B on the income statement, you're at 82.7 million, uh, but on the um, on the uh, payer mix table, you're at 86.6 million. And so I'm just wondering if if you can, at some point, reconcile those so that they 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 line up because it's hard to talk about payer mix issues. When I will, the difference between number. those are, are the bad debt and the free care. So I can add the bad debt and the free care into those to make them reconcile, but that is that is the difference. Okay, that's helpful. For each of the year. And uh, finally, um, I noticed that in terms of your, uh, and just forgetting, for aside, putting aside a moment, the fact that the, the payer mix table doesn't quite line up, you were booking um, a $2.6 million budget to budget decrease in 2021 Medicaid revenues. And um, if you could talk a little bit about that and if the announcement, the, re the recent DIVA announcement, you know, that they will not be allowing any rate increases other than those that are federally mandated in 2021, does that have a, does that change your, uh, your uh, approach to the 2021 Medicaid expectations? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I haven't actually thought about that question quite yet, so I, I don't have an answer, but I would be glad to get back to you on that. <laughs> okay. um, and with that, I'll pass you along to the, uh, next, the, the next questioner. Thank you, Tom. Next is uh, board member Yusufur Maureen. Uh, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for everything you've been doing during the pandemic. Um, I know it's been a really challenging time. Um, so just a couple things on the, the money that you received. Uh, just uh, did, I didn't hear you talk about the payroll protection plan and did you apply for that or get money there? And so how are you handling it? Yeah, no, we didn't because we have too many employees, so we didn't qualify for the payroll protection plan. Okay, that's fine. And then I think you did mention that you weren't looking for any of the state money in the 275 million in this round, but have you applied for any FEMA dollars as well or? No, we have not applied for FEMA dollars. Early on in the COVID crisis, I 
gone on to a couple different webinars um, and it didn't seem like any of the FEMA money. We had one inpatient COVID patient here at North Country and that we wouldn't benefit from um, much of anything from FEMA. Okay. Yeah, and we, we, Maureen, we've been, um, and Tracy has been in um, continuous contact with our auditors to also evaluate what the opportunities are when we surface them or they surface them uh, and, and do that cost reward analysis. Um, but we apply, we try to, you know, we, we try to be mindful of applying for things that we believe we can uh, receive. And we also have applied, and speaking of employees, we have applied for the employee hazard pay on behalf of the employees. Um, so that application was received, um, and we're waiting for uh, hopefully good news about that for our staff as well. And you mentioned that you were um, conservative on on some of the reserves that you're carrying, I think, for the COVID and how, how you're balancing that through. So I guess if you project to the end of the year, are you still holding some of the COVID money on the balance sheet that will offset expenses that may end up you know, dropping to the bottom line as well, because then you may be able to offset expenses you already had in there. And I guess, how is that reflected in your current forecast? I'll, I'll start and then I'll let Tracy clean up. Um, so when we say conservative, really what we're doing um, is being mindful of making sure what comes onto the income statement is defensible um, and auditable. And so when Tracy is talking about, um, you know, corresponding with our, our auditors, it's to make sure that we're fitting the criteria within um, the guidelines that they believe we should be following on the, the grant dollars received. Um, so, um, so we didn't want to book something that uh, could be for 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 in our institution or even for our board that would that would look like it's money that um, that could be taken back. So, um, I think we have until um, the end of the calendar year, um, and we don't know what the fall will bring. Um, so we're, we're being mindful and, and like I shared, we, we do have ongoing COVID expenses that we're lining up those dollars for. Um, we expect to use the rest of it. It's just a matter of, you know, being careful and um, not, not attributing it to something that's not COVID related. So how much do you have left on the balance sheet that you didn't pull through your P&L? Tracy, go ahead. Okay, we have about $2 million. And so basically, as far as how it would affect the project, pro, projection, excuse me, in the budget that you're looking at, it basically would just be an offset because we would draw down if we had $300 worth of expenses that were COVID related, we would draw our reserves by $300,000, but we'd also have $300,000 on the expense side. So the net would be zero. Okay. Um, and then in your commercial rate request, you didn't put in any requests for a COVID piece. But you did talk about in some of your expenses having some ongoing COVID screeners and things like that, you know, continuing on in 21. And and that was, you know, one of the things we would have looked at for for using, you know, that commercial increase with the thought that possibly in 2022 or in the future those would go away, right? right. You know, if we, if we needed to hire some additional staff. Um, if things proceeded along, vaccine, whatever, you know, sometime in 21, then in 22, you might not need that. So can you talk about what expenses you have in 2022, I'm sorry, 2021, that relate to COVID and why you didn't use the commercial, part of your commercial ask for that piece? Okay, so basically the, the expenses are very minimal. We hired two screeners for the doors um, and with that plus benefits is probably 50 or $60,000. And then we have um, uh, $20,000, $30,000 in for extra supply costs for COVID. Um, and what we talked about before also is that we also have this $2 million you know, there are two that we can use. So now the screener position, um, you know, is funded by that for at least a period of time. So we didn't think the amount was large enough to, you know, to fold that into an additional rate increase for the commercials. Okay. And then just trying to bridge your NPR from, an, an, you know, kind of what we've been doing with a lot of the hospitals, right, is going back to 20 budget, you know, 20 projection is a little bit off the map. And for your 20 budget, you were projecting uh, gross revenue to move from 199.7 to um, 202.7. So, you know, up about 
three million dollars. Um, and then for your NPR FPP, it's going down from 83.6 to 82.7. Um, and bad debt and free care are actually lower projected in 21 budget than 20. So, and I know there's a little bit of a payer mix, but you know, trying to understand why that's that, that gross to net is all evaporating when you're actually picking up money in the bad debt and free care as well. Okay, let's see if I can answer this in parts. Um, so on the gross revenue side, um, as I mentioned before, we budgeted our gross revenue based on where we were in February. And at February, we were, we were off budget by about 2%. So we took that and then we also took out, um, I think it's almost a million dollars for the ophthalmology OR cases. Um, and made the other service line adjustments for neurology and such and added on some for cardiology. Um, so when we when we finished doing all those adjustments, um, that pushed our gross revenues down. Um, our net revenue percentage overall, um, so when I look at it, I look at it overall with all the contractual allowances and the free care and the bad debt to make sure, you know, all the buckets come up to about what it, they would be running. Um, and so that percentage uh, dropped by about 1% over the last year. Again, we use year to date actual. Um, so it went from like 40% to 41%. Um, and so I think that would explain the different numbers, but without, you know, putting them on paper. But those, those are the different factors that weighed into the, to the changes. Does that well, answer your you, question? You also would have had an increase in gross related to commercial, uh, you know, your ass. And right. So some of that should have been retained. It just seems like when you're growing, you know, $3 million on the top line, as well as um, your bad debt and free care are projected to be $1.4 million lower in 21 budget than the 20 budget so you know that's a four and a half million increase and i get you're putting in you know these adjustments but to not have any of that drop to npr seems conservative we get we get about for every percent of rate increase that we do we get about five hundred and twenty five thousand dollars so if that helps um when you're thinking about it that's that's how it comes out with our payer mix um, and uh, with the payer effects that I um, explained earlier, you know, as far as how much we actually net out on when we increase our charges. Okay. We may want to follow up on this, just just sure. reconciling, you know, the, the gross increase and not having any of it drop to, NP, to net when you did have a, a rate increase and you are projecting favorability in the bad debt free care and not, not seeing a shift, huge shift. So, Absolutely. Um, one other thing, just on, you talked a little bit about the non-operating revenue, the 9.6 million, and I think you talked that, you know, you, you moved to a different investment company, but I guess just how do you typically handle gains every year that you would get? Because usually what we see in the non-operating revenue for most of the hospitals are, are adjustments between what their portfolio size was, um, not all taken necessarily just when you move to a different you know, to a different uh, firm. So, you know, I guess I just want to talk about that nine million change because it, it, it just seems a little bit out of line to what you'd have to book on the P&L um, and not having accounted for any of that earlier. Um, so basically um, on the profit loss statement that we submit to the state, it shows basically one piece of the puzzle it shows the nine million but it doesn't show the other piece of the puzzle for when it moves from one investment company to the other so one's nine million something and one's eight million something yes. and that nets out basically to be what our actual gain was for the year does that make sense yeah um, but I would have thought normally you would have booked the actual gain for the year yeah. I thought here so to have to book the nine million it seems like you would have already booked that over the years that you earned that yeah. It's, it was all, yeah, it's all related to unrealized. So the unrealized gain lost through, say, 15 years, okay. um, you know, it's, it accumulates. But this is really an accounting thing. It's an accounting um, entry. And so the auditors require, uh, our gap requires that when you change investment firms, the okay. new investment firm devalues the portfolio at what it is at the market rate at that point. There was no, you know, there was no cash out. There was no, you know, 
big inf in, in, um, infusion in cash to the hospital. It just, it, we hit it in January. Um, and then the market, you know, took a dive in, in March. So that, that whole bottom section of our, you know, and that, that's related to total, total margin just looks all over the place. Okay. But, and it's just something we'll have to track, you yeah. know, kind of and the, staffs keeping track of that. Cause when you go back and look historically, all of a sudden you look and say, wow, there's this huge. Yeah, and the reason, and, and Marie, the reason, sorry, the reason for the change also is um, the board had was evaluating our investment advisor and did we want to make a change. So it was very pur purposeful in evaluating that. And in the end, they concluded we wanted to switch to the new to the new investment advisor, which resulted in um, several hundred thousand dollars a year in savings um, to the plan because um, we were incurring those costs. So, um, so the new advisor were were pretty pleased with um, the the setup with that. So, great, right. great, right. okay. Um, and and just talking about costs and and cost savings. I mean, do you have any cost saving plans that you can talk about as you look to the future of things you're working on strategically to whether it's supply management. Um, Anything um, that area. Well, it, that really gets back into that adaptive active management. So, um, if, you know, on the slide sh uh, deck showing the operating gains and losses in that, that period of time through those months, um, we furloughed staff up to 200, which is um, close to 30, 30% of our workforce. Um, we adapted very quickly. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's really, that's, it's active management is um, we don't have we don't have a um, set of um, future forecasting operating expense improvements that we are already actively working on day to day. Um, there's not Derby Green would be the last example of something that was more of a long term strategic strategic. OK, and um, just one last question on cash. Um, you're showing that you're in your 21 budget with about $2 million of cash and your 20 budget had about 3.3 million. And with all the COVID money you've received, et cetera, it just, just seems like maybe you would end up a little bit stronger in cash, um, you know, when we're through this, which which isn't a bad thing. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of worked out how the federal, you know, the, the money that you received for COVID was really offsetting, you know, some of these expenses. but. Um, do you think there's any conservatism in that number in your 21 budget for cash? Uh, maybe a little. I don't think a lot. I mean, a majority of the cash balance we have now is the Medicare accelerated payments and a Blue Cross Blue Shield loan and, you know, the balance of that $2 million that we have that we're going to spend. So over the course of the year, um, you know, that's all going to basically go away. <laughs> so yeah. we may end up a little, a little better, but. I don't think we, substantially. And and we um, we're monitoring the cash um, every week, and Tracy does a, a monthly cash projection. Um, and so, if we take all the COVID dollars out, we believe that we're um, you know based on a one and a half percent operating margin. Um, it's it's pretty flat. Um, okay. Well, it is down from. You know, 2019, you had 2.7. 2020, you had 3.3 as your budget, and 21 budget is 2.1. So it's it's down quite a bit, but your board designated assets are increasing. So there's you know things going down there. So it was just more of a caution that it seems like you're you know lowering your cash, um, yet you're not really seeing that in your day's cash on hand projection per se. You're actually showing that stronger than um, where you had in 20. A little bit better than 2019 and so, so okay just just a one to look at that number that's all i have thank you thank you thank you maureen now we'll turn to board member holmes jessica great um thank you and a lot of actually now my questions have been answered um but and i would be remiss if i didn't also thank you for your efforts preparing for the pandemic and ensuring you know the safety of your community the safety of your frontline workers it's, it's truly appreciated we're trying to thank all the hospitals because we really mean it um, and so thank you. I can only imagine how difficult it would be to be a hospital leader in this, you know, particular year. So uh, thank you. Um, 
the one thing I'm trying to understand with every hospital is medical inflation assumptions. And I noted in your narrative that you talked about salaries and fringes increased by 6%, reflecting raises and inflation on benefits. And that stood out to me as other hospitals are growing, you know, the assumption on their uh, compensation has been zero to 3%. So can you talk a little bit about the 6% that's mentioned in the narrative? Um, and then in general, can you talk about um, assumptions you're making about the supply inflation, pharmaceutical inflation, and an overall weighted expense inflation that you have? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so the salaries, we put a 2% increase on the salaries, just yeah. on the top of what our base salaries were. And we increased our benefits by 4% based on feedback from our um, different insurance companies and such. So that's what we built in the budget for that. Um, our medical supplies and basic supplies, we put an increase of 3% on there. Okay. Um, so, and you know, overall, I'm not sure what the overall weighted inflation number would be, but um, I can calculate that and give it to you. That would be great. If you could follow yeah. up with that, that'd be fantastic. Okay, sure. so the 6% is really 2% on the, just the base yes. value and 4%. Okay, that That's makes correct. more sense to me than, I thought it was a 6% growth overall. And, yeah. Okay, fantastic, okay. Um, makes sense. Uh, the second question is just a little bit, maybe this is a little bit digging into a little where Maureen was going, but the charge uh, with the 3.6% charge, can you just maybe translate that into an effective commercial rate versus the charge? Is there a differential? So some hospitals will say this is a change in charge, but because we have discounts on charge with our payers, we have an effective commercial rate that's less than our change in charge. Mm. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, we have a, a net percentage that we get paid overall by our commercials. Is that what you're looking at? And then what that rate would be on the the charge? Yeah, by how much that your, your, what is your effective commercial rate? It may not be the same as your change in charge because of how payers may, your contracts might be, right? You're paid a discount on charge. Right. So if you increase your charge by 3.6%, but you're only paid a discount on that, based on the discount, average discount across commercial payers, your effective commercial rate will not be the full amount. Okay. Maybe I'm not explaining this very well, but this no, is- No, I, I understand what you're you're asking. Okay. You know, so if you look just all at all the commercial payers, we have different commercial payers, a certain portion of those are paying a percent of charge. Right. And some of those might be uh, and, they, and then they have an inflation of so much that they allow for a year. Um, so some of our payers may be already capped and some may not. I, I, I expect most of them aren't. But um, uh, that inflation, um, it, it's a matter of what's the mix of the commercial currency of, of that. And if you want to get back to us on that, that's okay too. So you don't have to. I think that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Maybe I could add to what to your question what they had on here, which is, on your backup chart, when you asked for 3.6%, you had 4.3 for hospital inpatient, 4.3 for out, 4.3 for professional, and then you had zero for primary and specialty. So is your commercial ask really 4.3 across everything, or does it average to 3.6 because you're not asking for it? I think that's what we're trying to find out. Oh, yeah, I can answer that question. So it's uh, 4.25, which rounds up to 4.3 on all the hospital charges, on the commercial hospital charges, and 0% increase on the physician practices and specialty charges, which averages out to the 3.6 percentage. Okay. That's a good question, but it's still not my question. Right. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> no, that's okay. But if, you know, and I'm happy yeah. to follow up with you afterwards if, if uh, uh, more clarity absolutely. is needed. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I'm getting some feedback from someplace. If everybody who's not the Are others hearing this as well? Yeah. yeah. I think we were all just muted, which probably yep. solved it. I but muted you have to unmute yourself. just so you're aware. If you're on the phone, you have to hit star six to unmute yourself when Kevin asks for um, public comment. But I'm sorry to interrupt you all. Please keep going. So Jess, you have to unmute yourself.
<laughs> Jess, if you can't unmute, maybe you have to call back in. Do you want to switch to me, Kevin, and then we'll go back to Jess? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, hi. <laughs> Sorry Hello. for the technical difficulties. Um, so uh, I had one question related to your reimbursement assumptions for Medicare. Um, did you make any assumptions about reimbursement changes in Medicare, increases or flat? And did you make any assumptions related to sequestration being removed for the remainder of this year? And Tracy, you are on mute now, so you must unmute. <laughs> better yes yes, yes. good okay um, so our medicare reimbursement percentage i would say is basically flat um and like i said we don't capture any more net revenue on our inpatient revenues and no i did not make any assumptions or changes in budget 21 based on sequestration great and do you have any sense of what that impact of sequestration is it Seems like it's fairly low yeah. uh, based on other hospitals' yeah. responses. I would agree it was low. I, I, I don't have an idea right off uh, the top of my head, though. Okay. Um, in terms of um, you, your slide 12 talked about uh, your locums as a percentage. Could you talk more generally about contracted labor and what you're seeing in terms of travelers, both pre-COVID, during, and after? I'll, I'll start, Tracy. So um, during COVID, so pre-COVID, we had um, just, um, I can't speak to the number because I just don't remember, but we had um, more travelers than we wanted. <laughs> yeah. um, we wanted to be zero, so one is still too many. But. Um, but we we actually rolled down to zero tra use of zero travelers through that that several months. You know, um, some had to we were able to um, get them off contract sooner, uh, but some they were nearing the end of the contract and we just didn't renew. Uh, mm -hmm. The majority of them are um, were RNs um, in our ED and our med surge, um, and we also had I think one in OR. Um, and then we had another one in um, radiology, um, a, a tech. Yep. And, uh, and so then through that period, um, we actually hired uh, two to three contract labor employees permanently. They switched over to employment. So That's we were able great. to get new talent that way. Um, fingers crossed that that will be long term. Um, but uh, but the situation uh, we played that out to our advantage um, in that short term, um, and then since then um, with our ramp up and our return to volume, we have had to return back to travelers. So I think we're at five to seven now. Um, um, I can't give it exact because it keeps changing. Yeah. Uh, it's back to the areas that we had before the struggles. It's we um, just talked about um, two ED RNs this morning. Um, a one for ICU, two for ICU, um, and uh, um, uh, another one or two at our ends. But uh, so that's going back up, um, and we we going back to market pay and and supply and demand. Um, we don't have a magic wand to to make it go away. Um, so yeah, exactly. and you 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 did speak about the VTC program. Uh, participation. Do you typically are you able to attract new staff from that yeah, program? Yeah. yeah, and this is the first year we've been able to return to doing the RN program, so we're excited about that. Right. Uh, and and we do. You know, we have some existing staff that that are in the program, so we are they already they're already employed. It's just stepping yeah. to a higher level of That's uh, great. service. Um, but yeah, we retain a, a good portion of those. Um, they don't all come here. Some of them go to the other area hospitals, but it helps. The more we, the more we produce, the better it helps float everybody up. Great. Yeah. Um, I was interested in your comments around telehealth because it's uh, mostly not what we've been seeing in other places. And I was curious if you could attribute what might be different about your population, whether it's the connectivity that's challenging 
uh, for video or, you know, that you are, I think, an older area of the state. What are your thoughts on that? So when you say we were experiencing something different than the other states, um, was it we were utilizing it more or? Uh, I would say probably 80% uh, during COVID is higher than other places and 10% is much lower than other places post COVID. So on um, both sides. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, I think, I think um, um, Robin, what we experienced was just by flipping it really quick um, and people wanting to continue to see their their docs and our yeah. docs didn't go home. Um, we didn't modify our hours for, for our clinics. They stayed open. So there was just, um, uh, I don't know, some positive energy of finding ways to connect with our patients. And then in some cases, we um, we were able to call patient. Our, our, uh, we had very low no-show ratings because if yep. someone forgot, we would call them. So yep. into a telehealth visit. And then the people that um, couldn't do video, obviously that would be a challenge um, for some people, but then we'd flip it right to a phone. And so it was still a telehealth visit. Um, so I, I, our, just our physicians and staff are really engaged in making that work. Um, and then and the, um, I, people just um, wanted to have that connection with their, their provider. Uh, yeah. And then um, flipping it back, when we started open open back up in, in May, um, it was a learning experience for us because we just, we didn't know what was gonna happen, but what we learned about our community is they, as much as they did the telehealth visits, they were eager to flip back to in-person and we were, we were we welcomed them and we set up, uh, it, it, told to, it told us that they, they felt safe. Um, a survey that I was um, with one of our consultants that I just received uh, two weeks ago said that 31% um, of patients um, responded to the survey, which was only, it was, it was a national survey, that 30% that 30, 30 responded that they're not comfortable going to their physician this year. So we're above average there because we, we aren't experiencing that. Um, another 30%, um, by the way, do not have primary care physicians. Um, another 30% of the patients responded that they would prefer a telehealth visit over an office that absent and of any mention of COVID. So um, that's interesting because we're seeing that they're wanting to flip it back. Um, so those, those are, I thought that was interesting and timely to give the information of what, how, how it's working in other um, areas of the country. Thank you. Um, and then could you speak a little bit about your plans for One Care participation in 2021? Have you budgeted dues and risk? And if so, what, how much? Yeah, so we are participating in all the same products that we were in FY20, and it's been budgeted. Um, and the risk, the risk, um, the risk is going down for the the pairs that we're in. So, like the Blue Cross went from six percent down to was it zero, Tracy? I think it's zero. Two to two. Um, the uh, Blue Cross went from to 2% for one and 1% for the other one. Yeah, and Medicaid went from four to 2%, so. And uh, you can follow up with us, but it, we are trying to populate our normal chart, which has the ACO dues by hospital, as well as any risk reserves that you've budgeted. So uh, I think we gave people till September 1st, but we do need that information. Okay, sure thing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's it for me. Great. Thank you, Robin. And sound check, Jess, are you with us? Am I? I don't know. Can you hear me? You are. <laughs> <Yeah. Okay. laughs> for some reason, when I get muted by Abigail, I can't unmute myself. So I don't know what it's a problem with, but I, I am back on. Um, I actually just had one more question. Um, and this is a little bit of asking you for a little bit more context onto the deep dive you did with service lines. Um, I can only imagine how challenging a process that would be. It might be met with resistance, takes a lot of courage to close services in a community. Closing Derby Green, closing Neuro, you know, understanding that you struggle with the balance to keep services local, especially in the remote area that you are with, you know, the long, longer distance to a tertiary care center or even another critical access hospital. So I'm just wondering, how, give us a little bit of context on how you make those decisions. What weight do you put on financials? What weight do you put on 
preserving access? What weight do you put on enough volume to ensure quality? How do you do that? And is that a process that's continuing? Are you feeling as if you've completed that process for now? So, um, so what we do and what we've done for the last number of years is we we work with our um, auditors. We've 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 said too much about our auditors in this this uh, presentation, <laughs> but but um, I think the point is uh, when I say that we 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 also seek outside um, professional assistance is what I'm getting at. But but we have a product that we um, ask them to do for us um, that shows what our contribution margins are by service line. Um, it's not perfect. There is no perfect system. It's not a true um, cost accounting methodology. But we look at um, what our contribution margins are by service line. Um, so when you're looking at, um, for example, I prefer to think of our physician practices are an investment um, because they they typically will not show. Uh, I can't think of any practice that shows a profit, um, but they're an investment, um, and that investment is rewarded on the hospital side. Um, so. So we pair those together and see, okay, how do the two tie together to, to support? And um, as you can imagine, it's really hard because, you know, um, to cross-reference that because a um, service line will will provide lab imaging, inpatient, you know, all those types of things, um, even ED visits. So um, so we we take that um, into consideration. So, and then we looked at the we look at the trending year after year after year and see what's the trending. Um, and in this case, neuro had been on our our sites of it was it was um, not a perf you know it wasn't penciling out um, and um, low volume of patients compared to you know to others. Um, and uh, and there's a need for it, but we wanted to we're grappled with okay how much need is there? So we pair it with another product of what our what our geography, our demographics can support um, from that product that we look at, and um, and so it's it's and and looking at those together, we we already had an idea that that might be a service line that that we can no longer support. So um, so when it came to the point that we were in dire straits and wanting to make sure we were meeting payroll and um, serving the immediate needs, that was a service line that we decided to let go at that point. Derby Greens, similar similar story, but that was a longer conversation and took a lot more, um, you know, uh, assessment. Did I did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, and it, really helpful. It's helpful to hear that you have the ability to compute contribution margins by service line. I'm not sure all hospitals have that, or so we've heard. So it's helpful to know that that is a possibility. Um, I guess I'm also just wondering: Are there ever situations where? The contribution margin may be positive for a service line, but the volumes are so slow, low that you would worry about quality. So it's it's helping your bottom line, it's helping keep the lights on, it's doing all the things that you need for your finances. But given you know the mostly in surgical procedures and areas where we know there's a volume and quality relationship, how does that factor in? And I also recognize access is an issue. So you, you know, there isn't a hospital nearby. So that has to factor in as well to that quality volume conversation. So I'm just wondering how you balance all three. Yeah. Um, and um, first, before I answer that, um, this contribution margin is not perfect. So, um, so, so, you know, other hospitals probably have other ways of looking at it. That's just the way we look at it. The, it's a very short list of what's a positive contribution margin. Um, so, uh, but you know, I guess um, some service lines that you may gravitate to would be like OB. Um, OB itself isn't isn't a um, positive service line, but OBGYN is. It's the it's the full case. So we're able to have obstetrician GYNs here that can support both ends um, of that service line, and so that's what makes it work. Um, and uh, and that's a that's an area where we have the quality because we have consistent providers that have been here for a number of years, um, and um, we have a, you know certified nurse midwife that has you know it's a small pool of people. You're talking three people that do all the deliveries, and so you they're sharing that you know um, 200 to 250 births a year, which is a small number, but it's at least it's just a small group of people that are providing service. 
And if it wasn't for us, then where would they go? We had a we had a delivery in the ED just a week ago, two weeks ago, um, that we we knew nothing about the patient. They came in and and delivered within um, 10 to 15, 20 minutes. So so quality there's that quality aspect of yeah you you know what's this magic number um, of uh, to, to, to reach a skill set um, and it's different for a new provider compared to a uh, you know the existing provider but in that case if you didn't have the service and some of that all hands on deck right. you you might get the service anyway you might have to perform the service anyway in a non-ideal setting well thank you I appreciate that answer that's all I had Kevin okay Thank you, Jess. So at this point, I'm going to turn the questioning over to the healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher. You surprised me, Kevin. I, no questions for you, huh? You know, it was uh, very fortunate that my questions were asked by other board members, so it made it easy. Um, I think just one or two questions or comments or questions ask you to think about. Um, I. Um, um, we did not do a deeper dive on bad debt and free care this year, um, but I was interested in the discussion about your reducing uh, uh, re reduced numbers of uncompensated care, your projections of that, and that discussion that maybe that has to do with um, an increase in navigator activity. Um, and just to, to say what, what we think we understand from other hospitals when we've looked at this is that, an, you know, a robust uh, financial counseling um, results in both, um, you know, uh, uh, better third-party payment, people signing up when they need to be signed up, uh, babies born to Medicaid, moms getting signed up fast, uh, um, complicated pay, payment issues like motor vehicle accidents or, or the like, um, but also results in a, um, a change in the ratio of bad debt to free care. And um, I'm not I'm not seeing that in your numbers. And um, in other words, uh, again, when you're when when we're doing good outreach and really uh, uh, making sure people know what's available to them, we find people who might be in the bad debt category uh, had we not reached out to them and let them know about it. I, I have any comment about that or whether you think there's opportunities in that. Or maybe I'll just leave with. I wonder if there are opportunities there that could be focused on. All right. I will definitely look into that with my, my patient financial people. Thanks. Um, and then lastly, I've been asking about race, and I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the challenges in front of us of really addressing uh, um, racial disparities and uh, institutional racism and whether you've contemplated steps or whether uh, what what you think the work is that needs to be done in a little hospital like yours? Um, just invite you to to think out loud about it with us. Yeah. Um, so uh, I I personally believe in um, and I believe our institution um, um, gravitates this already as just honoring the the rights of every the human rights of everyone. Um, obviously, the in our part of the state or um, region where we're not as diverse, but I can tell you coming from most recently the Midwest, um, I feel like this, our, our org organization culturally um, is a lot more um, diverse than it may appear, um, mm -hmm. whether it's race or sexual orientation or, you know, um, um, mm -hmm. those, those types of things. So, um, so, so, you know, I, I uh, I, our, our culturally, it's just going back to honoring the human rights of everyone. We do have, um, and this wasn't related to the recent events, but we have some sensitivity training that we're um, that we're bringing in um, around a particularly um, uh, an issue, um, not an issue, but something that we we're pretty pro proactive on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we have a, a consultant. Um, with a very personal experience that we'll be coming in and um, sharing and um, helping to relate of how people can relate to one another um, 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 when um, when I don't want to get into the details because I don't want to, but uh, but anyway, we, 
we have some sensitivity training coming on for a specific purpose. And, um, and then um, we also are incorporating um, what we uh, learn about this um, topic and others. We're incorporating it into our, uh, our annual Elsevier um, learning. Or it's our online learning that we require. So we have already courses that we require all staff to, to take every year. Um, and uh, it's you know 100% um, like 100% um, of the staff have to take these, so we're incorporating those and more of those into our um, online and uh, uh, learning. So, okay, thank you. I, I think uh, maybe I'll just part with the, the statement. I think we we all uh, need to keep this issue front and center and and ask ourselves uh, in, in a challenging way. Yeah, uh, what we need to do to um, to change some of the patterns that that we know exist in all, and I'm going to, including myself and all of our organizations. So, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and I would I would also add that um, we have already been onboarding international nurses. Internet, mm -hmm. it's really nurses because of the need, but um, that's bringing in a new um, opportunity for um, diversity and hearing and uh, relating to people of different experiences and backgrounds, beliefs. So that's gone very well. Good, thank you. Thank you, Mike. At this point, we're gonna open it up for public comment on the North Country budget. Would any member of the public wish to offer comment? And again, if you're on the phone, please hit uh, star six. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, um, I want to thank uh, Brian and Tracy for the presentation. And um, I see that um, Joe Wooden, are you listening in right now? Is anybody from Copley listening right now? <laughs> Well, not hearing back from anybody, I guess what we will do is we will stick to the schedule and start this afternoon's hearing at uh, 1.45. So, board, you have an extended uh, lunch period. And uh, again, thank you, North Country. And uh, we'll be back at 1.45. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.